So, brothers and sisters, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. What a victory. What a wonderful, blessed day. This is the reason why we are who we are, and this is the reason why we exist as the church. If it were not for what happened on this day 2,000 years ago, there would be no Christianity. You wouldn't even know what Christianity is. So today, I want to talk to you about the resurrection of Jesus, and I want to present to you reliable facts that this is not just some pie-in-the-sky belief that we have. It's not just some make-believe fable that we believe in, but I'm going to show you some hard evidence that is acknowledged by the vast majority of New Testament scholars who study the historical Jesus. And one of the things that they all agree on, there's these five major points about Jesus that the vast majority of these scholars agree on, and I want to show you that there is solidity to why we believe what we believe. But before we do that, we want to look at the Word of God, and so we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 20 this morning. And 1 Corinthians was written about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's a very early text. Just think about that. Just within two decades, uh, the Apostle Paul writes to this church in Corinth, and he deals with this subject of the resurrection. Chapter 15 is called the resurrection chapter. And he leaves that near the end where he's, he's dealing with this very important topic and he's basically saying, we make it or break it. This is it, folks. And so notice how he begins. He says, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. So what is that gospel? The good news, which I preach to you and which you also received, in which also you stand and by which also you are saved. So notice it's the gospel that's preached it's the gospel that saves. It's the gospel upon which we stand if you hold fast to the word I preached unless you've believed in vain. In other words, if, if your life's been truly transformed by Christ, there's going to be fruits, fruits of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's why he says, if you hold fast to the word which I preached unless you, you believed in vain. There's a lot of vain believers in the church. There's professing believers and there's genuine believers. And then he goes on to say this. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to introduce here, particularly in verses 3 to 4, he's going to introduce what is considered the earliest creed in Christianity. What is a creed? A creed is a statement of belief. The word creed comes from the Latin word credo. And that's why all confessions begin with, I believe. Credo. So, he's going to tell us what this earliest creed is. This creed predates Paul. Now, if Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in the, around 50, 55 A.D., this creed, scholars argue, originated in the Jerusalem church by the original disciples of Jesus, and it was being confessed orally in the Christian gatherings. And it was originated, listen to this, within months of the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is one of the earliest documents we have in classical history. Within months, they originated this creed. So here he says, For I deliver to you as of first importance, notice what is the most important thing here, you're going to notice is the death, burial, resurrection. Uh, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Notice that language, he passed and he received. This isn't Paul's information. He received it. And now he's passing it on. Where did he receive it from? Well, he would have only received it from the 12 apostles in Jerusalem. And we know, according to Galatians 1 and 2, that Paul took a visit to Jerusalem on two occasions. And in the first one, he met with Peter. And he spent, he said, 14 days with Peter. And I can assure you, they were not talking about the weather for 14 days. Peter was telling him about Jesus and what he was like and what he taught. And so Paul, although he received the gospel by revelation, he learned all these other issues, the, the Last Supper and all these tertiary matters, he learned them from Peter. So notice what he says. I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. Number one, Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. What were Christians teaching and preaching within months of the Christian movement? That Christ died as a substitutionary atonement for his people. Now that's important. Because Muslims will say, oh, the Christians invented that uh, centuries later. No, no, no. It was already being preached within months before Paul by the Jerusalem church. And that he was buried... Notice he says, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. So what is Paul doing? He's taking the Gospel Passion accounts, and he's shrinking them into a capsule. Now, what are the Gospel accounts? The Gospel accounts have been described as passion narratives with extended introductions. 
That is to say, the focal point of the Gospels is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the climax of the Gospel accounts. And then notice what he does. He now mentions the appearances of Jesus. He rose on the third day. Notice he backs it up with the Scriptures. And then he says, and he appeared to Cephas. Now that's important. Cephas is Peter's Aramaic name. Peter was born as Shimon, Simon. It was Jesus who gave him the name in Aramaic, Kepha, which we translate into Greek as Cephas, and in Greek his name is Peter, Petros. So Peter was like, you remember Rocky, Sylvester Stallone? How are you doing, right? <laughs> Peter was Rocky. Jesus gave him the name Kepha, which means rock. And we translate it into, it comes from the Greek word Petros. And so the fact that Paul calls him by his Aramaic name is very important because that means he had this close relationship with Cephas. And he knew his Aramaic name. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Think about that, 500 witnesses. That's enough to put you and I away for life. 500 witnesses would be about 50 hours of testimony in a court of law. 500 witnesses saw him, and then he says that um, these 500 brethren, most of whom remain until now, even though some have fallen asleep, that is, they died. What is Paul saying? He says, look, if you don't believe me, there's living witnesses. You can check this with those living witnesses. And then he goes on to say, uh, then he appeared to James. Now keep that in mind. We're going to come back to James. James is very important here. He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and then last of all, as one untimely born. Paul's saying, look, I'm kind of the odd guy out. I wasn't one of the original 12, but yet I got plugged in. And the word there, untimely uh, born, is a Greek word that means something like a miscarriage. I was out of date. I was untimely born. He appears to me last of all. Now, remember, folks, you'll hear a lot of people say things like, oh, Jesus appeared to me this morning, and we were uh, having a discussion, and, uh, you know, uh, and then he took me for a tour of heaven. The risen Jesus, the last person the risen Jesus appeared to was the Apostle Paul. That's why he says, last of all, he appeared to me. Now, visions did continue after that. You know, John saw him on the Isle of Patmos, he had visions, but the physical resurrected appearances of Christ ended with Paul. That's why anybody who claims to have seen the risen Christ after Paul is a liar, a false apostle. That's why you can't have apostles today. To be an apostle, you have to be a eyewitness to the risen Christ. And there's no one today who's an eyewitness to the risen Christ. And then he goes on to say, uh, he appeared to me also. And then he goes on to say, for I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But, there's that beautiful word again, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. You heard a lot of grace today from our baptismal candidates. And then he says, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I. Not the credit is not mine, but the grace of God with me. Now, this is very important, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. What's Paul saying? The message that they preached and the message that I preached is the same. It's not a different message. It's the same message that we preached. And then he goes on to say, now, if Christ is preached that he has not been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. I'm just an idiot up here if Christ has not been raised from the dead. I'm just, I'm just pulling out the wool over your eyes if Christ has not been uh, raised from the dead. And he even says, look, if Christ has not been raised and there's no resurrection, not only is our preaching vain, your faith is vain. It's empty. It's futile. Not only that, but we are found to be false witnesses of God. Because if God did not raise Christ from the dead, and we're preaching that God raised Christ from the dead, we are the biggest fools in the world. What I'm doing right now and what Pastor Steve does as a pastor, if Christ did not rise from the dead, you might as well shut down this building, put a for sale sign outside, and go home. But notice what he goes on to say. Because we testify that God raised Christ from the dead, whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, 
that not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. In other words, folks, Christianity is the only faith that stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus. You see, all other religions, all their leaders are dead. Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. Confucius is dead. All the Hindu sages are dead. All of them. Joseph Smith of the Mormon Church is dead. Charles Russell of the Jehovah's Witnesses is dead. But Jesus Christ left an empty tomb behind. He is not here. He is risen. You go to the cemetery and it says, Here lies Joe Smith. One of the funniest epitaphs I ever read said, Here lies Joe Smith. And why not? But you go to the tomb of Jesus and it says, He is not here. He's risen. He's left behind an empty tomb. God has impacted history by showing us that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was. And he was vindicated by his resurrection from the dead. You see, folks, you have to understand something. Christianity is not about Christmas. It's not about the birth of Jesus. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then his birth means nothing. His teaching means nothing. All his miracles mean nothing. Everything makes it or breaks it on the resurrection. This is why it is so pivotal. That is why the ordinances are all founded on his death and resurrection. What did you just see here today with our baptismal candidates? You saw a reenactment of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. They came here. They announced that they had died to their sins. And what did Pastor Steve do? He buried them in the watery grave. And then they rise again in new life. That is a reenactment of what Christ did. He died, he was buried, and he was raised again. And when we celebrate the Lord's table, what are we doing? We're declaring the Lord's death until he comes. You notice everything is absorbed into the death and resurrection of Christ. And so that's why Paul goes on to say about those who died, if Christ did not rise, then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Our loved ones have perished if Christ did not rise from the dead. They have no hope. But then he says this, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. If, if this is it, folks, if this is all there is, is just we, we live and we die and we get up and we go to, to our jobs and it's such a mundane existence, if this is it, Paul says, we are to be most pitied. If there is no God, there is no meaning to the universe. There's no objective purpose. We're just atoms in motion. We're just going through the actions. You know, we're, 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 we get married, we have children, then our children, they grow up and they do the same thing, and then our grandchildren, they grow up. And they, is that what life is all about? But Christ has been raised from the dead. And this shows us that God, if a, if a man is raised from the dead after being clinically dead for three days, and we know scientifically that inorganic matter cannot resuscitate itself, then that means God stretched his hand into history, into space and time, and God raised his son from the dead. And that shows us God cares about you. You're not just a blob of protoplasm. You're not just an evolved ape. God loved the world so much that he sent his son so that he would give his life as a ransom for many. And, and that means that life is precious from the womb to the tomb. You're precious image bearers of Almighty God, loved so much that the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, would take on flesh and die for you. And then he goes on to say, if you go to the next slide, he says that, well, not only does he say that Christ has risen from the dead and now we have hope, he affirms that reality. So I want to just tell you about the Five facts that we, we have on the historical Jesus. I just want to present these five historical facts. Now, it's going to feel a little bit like you're in seminary today. That's okay, because I'm a professor at the seminary. But uh, part of preaching is teaching. If you can't teach, you shouldn't preach. One of the gifts that Christ has given to the church is, is the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, and then he says, pastor teachers. And the word pastor there is connected. It's like a connective word. It's pastor teachers. That's why Paul says that elders must be able to teach. You have to teach. So what's the first historical fact we have on Jesus? The most fundamental, these five facts are, and this again is what New Testament scholars agree on as historical, hard, cold facts about Jesus. Number one, Jesus died by crucifixion on a Roman cross. Number two, he was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. 
Number three, the tomb of Jesus was discovered empty by his evil disciples three days after his death. Number four, there were post-mortem appearances where Jesus appeared alive to his disciples. And number five, numbers one to four cumulatively point to the conclusion that this becomes the origin of the Christian way. So let me take each one of those. Number one, we're going to talk about the death of Jesus that we celebrated on Good Friday. We're going to talk about his death. Now, what do we know about the death of Jesus? Well, what we know are the following. It was the most public event of his life. Crucifixion was not done in a corner. It was very public. The Romans would have people crucified in the thoroughfares in Jerusalem outside the walls. And the reason why they did that was to instill fear into people who would dare raise their fist against Rome. In other words, it was Rome's way of saying, you mess with us, that's what's going to happen to you. And by the way, when people were crucified, they were crucified naked. So even Mel Gibson couldn't get that right in The Passion. And most depictions of the crucifixion, you'll notice Christ is covered with a loincloth. He was completely naked. The Romans crucified people naked. Why? To heap shame on them. To insult them. And so Christ bore our shame. He hung there between heaven and earth. His body eviscerated by the Roman scourge that tore his flesh. Isaiah said his visage, his appearance was so marred that we would turn our faces from him. He was so beaten to a pulp. It was so public that people would walk by. That's why it says in the Gospels, they walked by and said, oh, he saved others, he couldn't save himself. If he's the Messiah, why doesn't he save himself? It's the most public event of his life, the most humiliating event of his life. It's accepted by all historians. Jesus of Nazareth died sometime between 30 to 33 A.D., we know he died and that he didn't just pass out because the spear thrust to his heart would have been the coup de grace, the means by which they killed him. And John says he saw water and blood come out. We now know what that is. In the past, we didn't know what that was, but cardiology shows us that when a person is in deep agony and pain, they experience an inflammation of the heart. Today, we call it myocarditis. And what you have is you have an inflammation of pericardial fluid. It's a membrane around the heart, and it, and it inflates, and it's filled with, li li with clear liquid. And so um, when they pierced his side, the way John explained it was he said, I saw blood and water come out. And that water, we now know, is the pericardial fluid that was enveloped around the heart, mixed with the blood that was in the chambers of the heart. And we know he died of, of basically hypobolemic shock and cardiac arrest. That's how physicians would describe it. Um, so he literally died of a broken heart, if you really want to get to the brass tacks of it. Um, the death of Jesus was also considered a scandal to Judaism. It was the death of an accursed criminal. You need to get this into your minds. The Jews, when they saw the idea that the Messiah would be crucified to them, a crucified Messiah was an oxymoron. It's like talking about a Jewish fortune cookie. It was an oxymoron. That's why Paul says the preaching of the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews. Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews. It's a riddle to the Greeks. Because to the Jews, according to Deuteronomy 21-23, whoever hangs on a cross or a tree is cursed by God. And how could the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Anointed One, how could he die the death of a cursed criminal under God's very curse? And Paul answers that in Galatians by saying, it was not that he was cursed, but that he was counted cursed for you. He took the curse upon himself as a sacrificial victim. In other words, he took the guilt. And it's all explained in Isaiah 53, how he bore our afflictions and how he took up our infirmities and how he was pierced for our transgressions and how he, he emptied himself like a guilt offering unto death. Now, those are the five points we know. So you'll know that when the apostles are preaching the gospel, you can see why the Jews are reticent about accepting it. What are you talking about, the Messiah being crucified? Are you kidding me? The king, God's anointed king, is, is hung on a cross naked and stripped? Give me a break. That's an offense. And why do you think Paul was so angry he wanted to kill the Christian movement in the book of Acts? To him, that was blasphemy to speak of, of the Messiah that way. And then on top of it, they say he's the son of God. And that's why Paul wanted to really take them out. He was trying to be like a Phineas, a zealous Phineas. Now, the next thing we want to look at about Jesus' uh, life as well is we want to talk about his burial. 
Now, this is important. It's part of the creed. He was buried. What do we know about his burial? There's a couple of facts we know about his burial. It ensures that he was clinically dead. You don't bury live people. Right? We don't bury live people unless it's accidentally. And the other thing we know about it is that he was buried by a Sanhedrist by the name of Joseph Arimathea. Now, people are saying, well, what's the big deal? Well, it's a huge deal. Because Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple of Jesus. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the equivalent of our Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of Israel. And the Sanhedrin had condemned Jesus to death. The very council that condemned him to death, you have a member of that council doing right by Jesus and giving him an honorable burial. Now, if I was writing the gospel accounts, I'd have someone like Peter or John or James or his faithful apostles do the honorable thing. But no, you have a member of the very council that condemned him. This is an embarrassing, this is known as the criterion of embarrassment, where this is not how you would have written the story. Now, Joseph was a secret disciple. And so what does he do? Well, the most insulting thing to do is leave a body unburied in the Bible. The scandalous thing. And so Joseph was a, was a wealthy man. He had his own family to him, and he wanted to do right by Jesus. He wanted to give him the honor, an honorable burial that he richly deserved. And so the burial of Jesus is considered a historical fact. Now, the other couple of facts we know about his burial are the following. It was witnessed by female disciples, his, his burial, and Joseph, since it was his tomb. Now, why is this important? Well, number one, it's important because it means the burial place, the location of the tomb, was known to both Jews and Christian followers. Why is that important? Because some people would say, well, they went to the wrong tomb on Sunday morning, and it was an empty tomb, and then they made up the resurrection. Not so fast. They knew where they buried him. And we know that the Jews would mark the tombs of holy men and rabbis. Jesus was considered a prophet, a holy man. And besides, Caesar had put a seal on it that no one was to disturb the tomb. And so the burial means we know where he is, we know there's a body in there, and we know the location. And nobody dare not break the seal that the emperor has placed on there. Now the next thing we know about Jesus as well is that three days following his death and his burial, so the in the next, uh, the next thing we find is this thing called the empty tomb. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, in the book of Acts, we have references to this empty tomb. Why is this important? All the Gospels and the book of Acts agree that the tomb was empty. Historians will admit the evidence is so overwhelming they call it the criterion of multiple attestation. That's their big scholarly way of saying. We have multiple sources that point to this, which means there's a historical core to this story. The tomb was found empty. Now the question is, how did it go empty? How did it become empty? All of them agree that that tomb was empty. Paul agrees, as we shall see again, that the tomb was empty. And historians overwhelmingly will say, yep, Sunday morning, that tomb was empty. But here's the problem. The empty tomb is not enough in itself to believe in the resurrection. Let's say uh, a, a loved one passed away and you got news that their body went missing from the morgue. Would you immediately conclude that Uncle Harry has risen from the dead? And that Uncle Harry is the Messiah? Of course not. The removal of a body or the absence of a body did, does not lead anyone to conclude Jesus was risen. That's why when the women came to the disciples and said, He's risen, He's risen from the dead. You notice what the disciples did? Yeah, right. Mary, you've been up all night. You're filled with grief. See, Jewish men knew that in the first century, they had two rules. You never believe women before coffee, especially when they come back from cemeteries in the morning. And they didn't believe them. They mocked them. They said, you guys, you know, you guys, you're just tired. And, and they, they, just, they just berated them for believing that Jesus was risen. Why? Because the disciples knew, everybody knew, dead people don't just get up and walk. Right? The death rate is still one per person. You ask a funeral director, how many of your clients actually get up, you know, out of the casket? And None. We haven't had none in 20 years. But something happened here. Something happened. The tomb was empty. And so what did Mary Magdalene, 
who, by the way, was the first witness to the resurrection. Did you know that? So this is important, ladies. Because a lot of people will tell you the Bible's a male chauvinist book and, and it's anti-female and so forth. But that's very strange because God came into the world through a woman. His parent was a woman. Not a, he didn't have a human father. His human parent was a virgin mother. He graced womanhood with the incarnation. His flesh was the flesh of his mother. If he looked like anyone, it would have been his mother. And in the resurrection, the first human eye to touch him, to see him rather, and then to touch him, was Mary Magdalene. He graced womanhood with his resurrection. So much for the male chauvinist Bible, huh? So the next thing we also realize about this empty tomb is that the Apostle Paul implicitly mentions it when he says he was buried and he was raised. There's one thing we know about the Apostle Paul is he was a Pharisee. And what's one thing we know about the Pharisees? They believed in resurrection. Now remember those Sadducees? What is it that they didn't believe in? The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see? And so the Pharisees believed in resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see? So Paul mentions it in the creed that he was buried and then he was raised. And if you've got a body in there and it's raised, you don't have a body in there anymore. That's resurrection. Now if we move on, what we find is that not only do you have the discovery of the empty tomb, well, you've got women discovering it. Now that's not good. In first century Judaism, you know how much value women had as witnesses? Zilch, nada, zero. Josephus tells us, the first century historian says, do not admit the witness of a woman in a court of law. Do not believe the testimony of women, because they're uncanny. And who discovers the empty tomb on that first Sunday morning? Is it Peter? No. Is it Philip? No. James? John? No. Who discovers the empty tomb? It's the women. They're the first witnesses to the empty tomb. And the gospel writers, they know they're going to shoot themselves in the foot by recording it's the women. It would have been more natural to have, you know, Peter or John, the beloved disciple, or James discovering the empty tomb. No, it's women. Counterintuitive. The worst way to destroy your testimony. Why do you think Paul doesn't mention the women in his list of witnesses? He only mentions the men. He includes the women in the 500, but he doesn't specifically mention the women because he's writing to Corinth, a Greek church, and he knows they don't believe in the testimony of women. You see how the dots connect? Now, if we go to the next... Uh, we're on the next slide. Um, the other thing we need to realize is you got the death, you got the burial, you got an empty tomb. Okay, there's an empty tomb. Maybe they stole the body. That's what Mary thought. They took the body and they, they took it somewhere else. But here's something else. Jesus appeared to his disciples. We call these post-mortem appearances, after-death appearances. And historians generally agree that the disciples in, experienced appearances of Jesus, because there's no way to explain their witness or, or, or how they described what they saw. And these appearances, by the way, were not to just one person. These appearances were to groups of people, like the Twelve, James and the Apostles, the Five Hundred, and they were in different locations. You'll notice in the Gospels, you'll have Jesus appearing in Galilee, you'll appear in, in, in Judea, Jerusalem. He'll appear in Emmaus, on the way to Emmaus. He appears to the Apostle Paul in Syria as he's on his way to Damascus. So these appearances were not just in one area. They were, they were widely, widely distributed. And also, the post-mortem appearances in and of themselves were not enough to convince the early disciples that Jesus was raised. Well, why? Because we know that people experience, after they lose a loved one, some people experience hallucinations. Well, let's go to the next slide. We want to talk about the origin of the Christian way, and we're going to come back to this, this whole hallucination theory. It doesn't, it doesn't hold any water at all. It's actually been aptly refuted. When you look at the origin of the Christian way, what we find is that the origin of the Christian way occurs because of the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and the post-mortem appearances. You put those together, and you'll notice this is what leads to the beginning of the Christian movement. Remember the disciples, they were all in hiding, in fear of the authorities, and then they started thinking about, 
For 40 days, Jesus would come and talk to them, and he would appear to them. And, and they're, they're trying to make sense of this. And even Matthew 28 says that when they met him on a mountain, it says that, that they believed, but some still doubted. They just couldn't get this thing around their head. How, how can this man who, who died a vicious death, we saw him, how, how could he be alive again? And the only explanation that the disciples give for this event is found in Acts 2.32. This is their testimony. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact. They explained it as a divine act. God raised them. And we're witnesses. We're not get, getting this from second-hand, third-hand sources. We saw him. We ate with him. He broke bread with us. Thomas could say, I, I saw the marks in his hands. I saw the mark in his side. And I was a doubter. I was an empiricist philosopher. I wouldn't believe unless I had sense perception, the five senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, and so forth. I saw him. I saw the marks. And he was tangible. And so that's what led them to this conclusion that God raised Jesus from the dead. But there's more to come. There was a radical change in the disciples. If you look at them pre-Easter and post-Easter, you're going to notice there's a personality shift. And psychologists know that when people experience very significant personality shifts, they were either traumatized by a certain event, something significant clicked. Something that happened to them caused a personality shift. So what do we see about the disciples when we look at them? Most of them died as martyrs for their faith in Christ. Now think about this. Why would these Jewish men die for this guy from Nazareth who claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and experienced a brutal, vicious death? Why would they be willing to die for something that they weren't sure about? Now just think about that. No one dies for a lie. Your life is too precious. You wouldn't give your life for a lie. Yet these men went to their deaths with the confession that Jesus was Lord, that Christ had risen from the dead. And even if people die because they're part of a cult, let's say Jim Jones, the People's Temple, or David Koresh's, the Branch Davidians, people will only die if they believe what they're dying for is worth it. When soldiers go to war, they do it because they believe that they're dying. If they do die, it's for the righteous cause, for their country, and so forth. These disciples were willing to lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. And since then, millions of people throughout history have given their lives. And that's why the word martyr means literally witness. It's a Greek word, marturos, that literally means witness. That's what it means. Now, if we move on, what do we find about these disciples? They went from a defeatist, hopeless estate to a bold and changed personality. Compare Peter before the, 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 the Easter event. I don't know the guy. Yeah, of course you know him. We saw you with Jesus. I have no idea who you're talking about. Come on, you, you were with him. I mean, your, your accent gives you away. You're Galilean, like he is. Which means the Galileans had a certain accent. You know? Think about that. They had a particular accent. And they were able to distinguish them. If I came up to you here today and I said, How you all doing? You'll go, Oh, you're from the south. It's a certain accent. And so Peter goes from hiding denying his master, and even swearing that he doesn't know him, and look at him on the day of Pentecost. Two different Peters. Two different Peters. The Christian movement also experienced exponential growth. And it wasn't by the sword. It's not like our Muslim friends say, you know, we know Islam is true because look how fast Islam is spreading. Well, yeah, when you put a knife to someone's throat and say convert or die, we can understand why they'd say, oh, okay. And the birth rates, of course, they have larger birth rates and so forth, but the Christian movement didn't expand by the sword. It expanded through love and the gospel of grace. And we know that 20 years after, by the year 50 or so, according to Acts 18, there were Christians in Rome. In the imperial city, the capital of the imperial city, Rome, there were Christians there already 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. That is rapid growth. How do we know this? Because Aquila and Priscilla were in Rome, and we know the Emperor Claudius expelled all the Christians from Rome, and then they came down 
And guess who they met? They met the Apostle Paul. And they became missionary partners with the Apostle Paul. So we have that exponential growth. Now, if we move on, you'll notice a couple of other things. Remember I mentioned James in the Creed, that he appeared to James? The conversion of James, the Lord's brother, is significant. We know his brothers didn't believe in him. According to John 7, 5, it says his brothers did not believe in him. But yet, James came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah and the risen Lord. Now think about that. Do you know what it's like living with a perfect sibling? Remember the Brady Bunch? It's always Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Remember that? In, in the household in Nazareth, it would have been, it's always Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. How do you deal with a kid that never lies? A kid that doesn't swear at his parents, doesn't disobey his parents? How do you deal with a perfect sibling? You can understand why his brothers hated him. Not only did they hate him, they wanted to get him in trouble. In John 7, 5, they, oh, go to the feast, go to Jerusalem. They wanted to get him in trouble. They're not even at the cross when he dies. There's nothing said about them. And then all of a sudden, James comes to believe that his brother is the Messiah. <clears throat> and not only does he believe he's the Messiah, he becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church. And by the way, it's not Peter. There's no papacy here. And it's not Peter leading the church in Jerusalem. It's James. I mean, after all, he's the Messiah's brother. How do you top that? And then he writes a letter. So the letter of James in your, in your New Testament is written by him. There's another brother of his that wrote a letter. His name is Jude. And, you know, we think of Jude and go, Jude, you know, it's like the Beatles. Hey, Jude, don't let me. But Jude is the anglicized form of the Greek word Judas. And the reason why the English translators translated that letter as the letter of Jude was they thought, well, if we call it the epistle of Judas... You know, Christians, you know, what are they going to think? Are they going to think Judas Iscariot wrote a letter? Wow! And so they anglicized it. We know it as Jude, but we know from Matthew 13, 55, Jude was a brother of the Lord. And he too came to faith in Jesus. So what explains the conversion of James? There's only one thing that can cause such a personality shift, and that is Christ appeared to him. That's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. He appeared unto James. Now, the next one we want to look at is this guy, Saul of Tarsus, Shaul of Tarsus. This guy was brilliant. He was a Jew from Tarsus, which was up in modern-day Turkey. He also um, spoke uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and possibly Latin. He also had a Roman name. His name was Paulus. And so we know him today as Paul. His Hebrew name is Saul. Saul means great. Paul means small. So even though, remember what he says, I am the least. So he chooses his Roman name in his letters, Paul, Paulus. This guy was out to wipe out Christianity. He wanted to kill Christians. He wanted to imprison Christians. And so what do we find? He goes out to, to do the zealous thing, to stomp out this heresy, this Jewish heresy. And then on the way to Damascus, he tells us that this brilliant light strikes him. And he hears someone. Those who were with him saw the light. They heard, but they couldn't make out what the sound, what the words were saying. They heard a sound. And Paul hears this voice saying, in Aramaic, by the way, he's speaking to Paul in Aramaic, because Luke transliterate, uses the Aramaic name Saul. Jesus is speaking in Aramaic to, to Saul and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Just remember that, folks. When we persecute the disciples of Christ, when we persecute the church of God, do you know who we're persecuting? We're persecuting the Lord. What you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. So this guy, who was a vicious persecutor of the church, becomes a believer in Jesus. So remember when Ananias came along and says, and Barnabas and says, oh, by the way, you know that guy Saul? He's one of us now. And they're all like, yeah, right, and pigs fly. They wouldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that this, this, this terrorist would be turned into a follower of the very one that he was blaspheming and, and attacking. Well, what's the only way you can explain this? Well, Paul tells us. He appeared to me. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Christ Jesus our Lord? 
And so if we move on, we see something else. The disciples did not expect Jesus to rise from the dead. You need to understand that the disciples in the first century were not going around saying, the Messiah is going to come, he's going to die, he's going to rise again. There's nothing in first century Judaism to indicate that the Jews had that belief. Now, why is this important? It's important because the Jews believed in the resurrection at the end of the world. And so when they heard that Jesus was going to die and rise again, they thought, yeah, at, at the end of time. You see that in John eleven twenty four 24, when Jesus goes to Bethany to raise Lazarus and his sister comes and she's weeping and she says, if you were here, Lord, my brother would not have died. Jesus says, don't worry about it. He's going to rise. And she says, I know in the last day, of course he's going to rise. And Jesus says to her, and this is Tony Costa's paraphrase, he says to her, you're looking at the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks her this question, do you believe this? And he asks you this question this morning, do you believe this? The disciples did not understand what he meant by dying and rising again on the third day because they didn't believe in the dying and rising Messiah within history. If anyone rises, it's at the end of, the, of time. And so this could not have been a Jewish belief because the Jews didn't hold to it in the first century. And it could have been a Christian belief because there was no Christianity officially until Pentecost. So this is what we call, big fancy word scholars use this, this is called criterion of dissimilarity. It's dissimilar. It's something that cannot be explained. It's something novel that cannot be explained. It couldn't have been a Jewish invention, a Christian invention. If we get the next slide, what we find is that there's been a lot of critics who've come through the years. And they've tried to explain how the resurrection story started. And I just want to go through these critics just to give you some answers, because these, these theories have all been debunked, every single one of them. So look at the first one, the swoon theory, the apparent death theory. What these guys will say is that Jesus really didn't die. He passed out on the cross. He swooned. And the Romans, you know, they were so dumb, they didn't know. They thought he was dead. Now, you're talking about these Romans, were, were, they were executioners. They could tell if you're dead. Why do you think they thrust the sword into his side? Now, the other thieves, if you remember the two thieves, one of them who was saved, you remember they broke their shin, their, 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 these bones here. They would take mallets and they would break the shins to hasten death. The Sabbath was drawing. Remember, it's Friday. The Sabbath begins at sundown. As the Sabbath is coming, and it's also the Passover, they wanted to hasten their death. Why would they break the shins? Well, because when you're on the cross, you have to understand the gravity drops your body down. But in order to breathe, your rib cage has to expand. And so what they would do is they would raise themselves up, expand their rib cage, and then they would drop. After a while, you would die of asphyxiation because your body would tire out. But in order to hasten death, they would break their shin bones so they wouldn't be able to lift themselves up, and they would die a horrible death. Uh, basically, they're, just, they're, they're, they're basically suffocating to death. But because Jesus was dead already, they didn't break his bones. Now, why is that? Because the Passover lamb cannot have any of its bones broken. If the Passover lamb has one broken bone, it's disqualified. And so what did they do? They pierced his side to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah and Zechariah. They will look upon me whom they pierced. They pierced his side just the way they would pierce the lamb when they killed it. They pierced his side and blood and water came forward. So we know he was truly dead. And then they would bound, they would bind up his body in these, uh, these grave cloths and then they would put him in the tomb. Now imagine, Jesus uh, resuscitates in the tomb He's completely bound. And then he's got these, these marks in his arms and his feet. He's got these, this gouge in his, in his left side of his chest and so forth. So imagine this. He gets up, rolls a stone that takes about 20 men to roll, and then sneaks by the guards, appears to the disciples in that state. The disciples would be saying, my goodness, get this man to a hospital. They would not be saying, my Lord and my God. The substitution theory is basically thrown out the window. It's no longer believed. It's, in fact, it, went, it was put to bed in 1835 by a liberal German critic. The second one, the substitution theory, this is the view held by Muslims, that Jesus did not die on the cross, he was not crucified, nor was he killed. The Quran is very clear, chapter 4, verse 157, وَمَا سَلَبَهُ وَمَا katalahu. 
They did not crucify him for certain. They did not kill him for certain. That his appearance, it seemed as if they killed him, but they didn't. It was someone else. Now, the Quran is 600 years too late, and the Quran is getting this from Gnostic sources. Gnostics were heretics. They didn't believe Jesus was a real human being, and they believed that someone that had the resemblance of Jesus was put on the cross. Well, we know that's not the case. There were eyewitnesses at the cross. John was at the cross. His mother was at the cross. There were relatives at the cross. It was Jesus. The Sanhedrin would make sure it was Jesus and not somebody else. Substitution theory is out the window. Number three, the conspiracy theory. Matthew 28 says that when the tomb was found empty, reports came back to the Sanhedrin that the tomb was empty. So what did they do? They bribed the guards. Now notice what they did not deny. They didn't deny the tomb was empty. They tried to give it a naturalistic explanation, so they paid off the guards and said, just say that in the night when you were asleep, the disciples came in and stole the body and made up the whole thing. Now here's the problem. Imagine going to a court of law, and you're saying, my, uh, my neighbor Jerry, Your Honor, he stole my... Uh, he stole my smart TV. And the judge says, well, how do you know that? He's, and then you say, well, Your Honor, as I was sleeping on the couch, um, I fell asleep on the couch, and then in the morning I noticed that my TV was gone and, and the window was open, so I think Jerry took it. And he says, the judge would say, well, how do you know that if you're asleep? How do you witness things while you're asleep? I mean, the story is laughable on its face. It makes no sense. Now, some people have said, but wait a minute, uh, Romans, if they slept on duty, they would be killed, which is true. But whoever said they were Roman guards? Did you ever know that the temple had temple police? They had Jewish guards who went and arrested Jesus on that night? Those were Jewish guards at the tomb, not Roman guards. Roman guards would be killed for sleeping on duty. And so the conspiracy theory says the disciples went and stole the body and put it somewhere else, and then they said, hey, everybody, Jesus has risen from the dead. What's the major problem with that? Why would anybody in their right mind make up that story and then die for it? People don't die for a lie. It makes no sense. Number four, they went to the wrong tomb. So think about that. Wasn't it Joseph's tomb? Didn't Joseph know where his tomb was? Didn't the women witness his, his funeral? They were there. They saw him being buried. I mean, this isn't like you know, people think this was like Mount Pleasant Cemetery. We've got thousands of, of tombs. No, this was a garden tomb. It was a family tomb that Joseph owned. So that theory is out the window. Notice these are all naturalistic explanations. None of them deny the empty tomb. And then number five, the hallucination theory. The disciples hallucinated Jesus alive again. Now, I can grant individual hallucinations, 500 people hallucinating the same thing at the same time? You ever see that before? Where 500 people are saying, hey, well, we look at that. Look, it's, it's a pink elephant. No. Hallucinations are subjective experience to individuals. But Jesus appears to 12 people. He appears to 500 people. He appears to the women. And they see him. Not only do they see him, they touch him. So hallucination theories only work with individuals. They don't work with mass groups of people. 500 people hallucinating the same thing. People will say, well, you know, if you get a hypnotist, you can, you can, you can make people think they're all chickens. But you need a hypnotist to be there, to actually hypnotize people. He has to be there. So the hallucination theory is out. It doesn't explain what happened. Number six, this is one of my favorites. The twin theory. Like that movie Dave, where the president was replaced. Jesus had a twin brother. That's a surprise. At Christmas, we should be singing about the two virgin sons of Mary, but we don't. And it's kind of odd that when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John mentions the family of Jesus, they never mention his twin brother. But there are people out there who would say, well, Jesus actually had a twin brother. And some suggested it's Thomas. Because if you know anything about Thomas in the New Testament, his Greek name is Didymus. And if you know any Greek, you'll know the word Didymus means twin. But that doesn't mean he's Jesus' twin brother. And so the theory says, Jesus' twin brother came to Jerusalem on Passover weekend, heard about what happened to Jesus, went to the tomb, threw his body out, 
and then appeared to his disciples, and his disciples was, oh my goodness, it's Jesus, he's risen from the dead. Now just think about that. What is the, what is the probability of that even being even possible? I mean, there is no twin brother. He had no twin brother. This is how desperate people get to try to explain the obvious. And then finally, you have the pagan dependence theory. And this comes from folks who say things like, well, you know, the, the pagans believed in dying and rising gods. And therefore, uh, you know, people believe that Osiris died and he rose again. And remember that, remember that documentary, Zeitgeist? I mean, it, it, I mean, it was the, the worst documentary ever made. No references, no footnotes, n n nothing to back up their claims. Horus had 12 apostles and Horus was baptized. N no, 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 no. No, I, you know, I share that with some of my Egyptology professors at the university, and they all started laughing. There was no pagan dependence theory. Well, how do we know that? Well, we know that because the pagans didn't believe in resurrection. Osiris was the, the god of the underworld in Egypt, but he never came back. He remained in the underworld. He never came back to life. And when the pagans spoke about their gods dying and rising, it had to do with the cycle of nature. So the crop cycle. You look at autumn, the trees, the leaves fall, everything looks like it's dying. And then in the springtime, everything seems to spring out. It, it, it comes out, it, it, it comes to life. And so they believed that their gods dying and rising were connected to the cycle of nature. That's not what Christians believed. Christians believed that a historical figure in history lived among us, and he really died. And he was really resurrected from the dead. And any pagan notions that were, were charged against Christians, they come centuries after the Christian movement. They're not even from the first century. They come much later. If anyone's copied anybody, it's the pagans copying the Christians. So, how can we conclude here today? We can conclude by saying none of these theories uh, hold any water. They, they've been generally rejected by scholarship. And so this leaves us with a very important question this morning. Where do you stand with this risen Jesus? God raised him from the dead, and the ramifications of that is massively huge. Because what that means is that if Jesus rose from the dead, not only is he the one he claimed to be, but that means God exists. And if God exists, then that means that there's an afterlife. And if there's an afterlife, then that means you're going to face Jesus Christ one day. And I will guarantee you on this one, Though I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, I will tell you this. Every one of you today in this room will meet Jesus Christ. Every human being that has ever lived, is living, and is yet to live is going to meet Jesus Christ one day. There's two appointments you'll never be late for. Your appointment with the undertaker if Christ tarries is coming and your meeting Jesus Christ. And you're going to meet him either one of two ways. You're either going to meet him as your savior or you're going to meet him as your judge. We are people outside of Christ. We are depraved. We are rebels against a holy God. And we cannot save ourselves. You heard that from our baptismal candidates. But the good news is that God sent his son into the world to take your place, to pay the debt you could not pay he paid a debt that he did not owe because you had a debt that you cannot pay. And God raised him from the dead to vindicate him. And so today, if you don't know this risen Christ, that's really what Easter is about. It's about Christ's victory over death, over sin. If you don't know him today, you're going to meet him as judge. And the good news is this. That gospel that these early followers of Jesus proclaimed was this. The good news is this, if you turn from your sins, if you repent of your sins, if you believe that Christ took your place on the cross and that he was raised again from the dead, the Bible says, if you confess Jesus with your mouth that he is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And the promise says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That day of grace is open to you today. And the Bible never talks about tomorrow. It's always today. Today, if you hear his voice. Today is the day of salvation. Why not tomorrow? Tomorrow may never come. So many people I've met, oh, next year I'm going to do this. Next week I'm going to do this. Oh, did you hear that he passed? 
We live on borrowed time. Every day is a, is a gift of grace. And so if you don't know this Jesus today, I implore you, be reconciled to God. Will you come to him? Will you give your life to him? He's the only one who can give you meaning and purpose in life. He's the only one who has conquered death and gives us the assurance that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Don't leave this place unless you've made peace with God. And I pray, for those of you who don't know Christ this morning, I pray that God grants you neither peace nor rest until you make peace with God. Thank you.